Hi, I'm Ron Wheeler. I am a full-time cartoonist and I've been one since 1980. I tell people it's a tough job but somebody's got to do it. So I've had a lot of fun with this career but really you got to know the whole story. You got to know how I became a cartoonist to understand the type of things that I do today. And for that uh, we have to go back to the, to the beginning and um, actually I began drawing cartoons since I was a little kid. Um, I drew on church bulletins when I was a kid, and that's the earliest memory I, can, I have of being a cartoonist. But I didn't really have success with it until I was in college. And um, to be able to contextualize this, I need to show you a couple of comic strips that I did um, shortly after I became a professional cartoonist that help explain where I'm coming from. This first one is uh, from a magazine cover, and it was on the subject of evangelism. A lot of the work I do is for Christian ministries and publishing companies, but don't let that dissuade you. It's, I'm, um, I do work for all kinds of different organizations and, and groups. But this comic strip in particular has a point that I, that I want to make, and same with one that I'm going to show right after that. So to, to understand that, you need to look at this first panel, and I'll walk through it all with you. This says, that man looks like he needs a tract. So this is the whole evangelism process. And see, you can see this is an, uh, your typical nerdy Christian. He's got polka dot shirt and striped pants and a tract in his hand, and he's looking for a target. And so here's his target. He sneaks up behind him, and this is his target. He can tell he's a non-Christian because you see the thought balloons. It's shallow thoughts, shallow thoughts, shallow thoughts, shallow thoughts. He's smoking a cigarette and drinking a beer. So he has to be a non-Christian. So here's his approach. He screams, Banzai, and he's got the tract in his teeth, and he leaps on the guy's back. And he's got him by the neck and he's throttling him and he's screaming, believe or die. And the guy drops his cigarette and his beer and, he, and so he's, he has his tract and he's literally cramming it down the guy's throat. And he's screaming, take my tract and believe. And he's still screaming, you must believe, while the guy breaks free and he runs away. And so he sees he gets away and then he, the guy says, well, at least I sowed some seeds. Now, that phrase, sowing seeds, um, in the Christian community, that means, um, well, at least I helped advance the gospel message. I, uh, you know, some people reap and some people sow, and so he feels like he really helped his cause by, by being obnoxious with his faith. And of course, that's not the right way to behave. But I wanted to show you that cartoon first, and then here's one that shows the opposite extreme. This was a comic strip I had tried to syndicate at one time. This character named Dipstick, he looks at his, his friend Ralph and he says, What are you doing, Ralph? And Ralph says, I'm writing a guest editorial for the local newspaper. They like to buy guest editorials from time to time, reflecting the heartfelt convictions of the public. How do you like this for a title? Jesus is Lord. Is that too intense? I don't want to turn people off right away, you know. Maybe I should say Jesus is an important consideration. Or better, God is an important consideration. Jesus is God anyway. Or how about religion is an important consideration? Or more simply, religion is a consideration. Or better, philosophy is a consideration. No, wait. Philosophy is something to think about. Let's see. What's a better word for philosophy? I got it. I got it. Thinking is something to think about. He sees how stupid that looks. So he goes back to what he started with. Jesus is Lord. And Dipstick says, go for it. Now, the reason I bring up these two comic strips is not to um, show you the best of my comic strips. I've done comic strips for years, and, but these strips speak to a specific point I want to make before I go into my story. On one hand, when I give you my story of how I became a cartoonist, it goes along with how I became a Christian. And I don't want to come across like this guy. I don't want to cram anything down anybody's throat. By the same token, I don't want to be like this guy and try to water down what happened in my life. I'm just giving you the history of what happened in my life of how I became a cartoonist and it's unavoidable to talk about that without talking about how I became a Christian. So I hope you um, um, can appreciate that and continue to, to listen to this message and maybe get, glean something from it. So I call this story the four words that changed my life. Now to begin this, we have to go back to college. I said that uh, earlier that I drew cartoons from my earliest memory of drawing on church bulletins, but then I didn't find any success with it until I was in college. 
Now, we didn't go to church as a family. Uh, I stayed in church just long enough to get baptized, I guess, at age 11. And I remember coming home and taking my, my confirmation book and throwing it on the shelf and saying, boy, I'm glad I'm done with that. And uh, I felt like I had my fire insurance and, and I didn't need to really pursue anything with regard to my, uh, my Christian beliefs, such as they were. I'm not sure I really was a Christian at that time. And my parents, because they went through a church split about that time, they were so wounded from that experience, felt like church was nothing but being about money, they quit going to church. And so I didn't have any Christian experience really growing up beyond the age of 11. But in college, I had this comic strip that uh, gave me a real measure of success, uh, a different type of success. It was a... a uh, uh, an emotional success that I felt like I could really do something good. Um, this was the comic strip. It was called Ralph, and, and uh, this is me standing there in college. I haven't changed a bit. I know you can tell. I'm wearing what's actually a Ralph t-shirt. This is a Ralph t-shirt of Ralph wearing a Ralph t-shirt who's wearing a Ralph t-shirt. And I'm standing there with the same pose as Ralph wearing his Ralph t-shirt. So, anyway, and then this picture this is me, this skinny guy right there, this skinny guy right there is me, and um, I'm standing next to a guy from my fraternity who's wearing a Ralph head I made out of paper mache, and he's carrying a sign that says, Ralph for Homecoming. And the reason he's carrying that is because uh, I ran my cartoon character for Homecoming at the University of Nebraska, a 20 some thousand student university, and my cartoon character actually won. And so I had him go down on the football field to receive the honor. And, um, and I sat up in the stands and watched it all. It was really, it was really a lot of fun. Um, it's probably my greatest claim to fame, I guess you could say, uh, at least at that, at that point in life. But I had this great measure of success, and I, it really whet an appetite inside of me to be a cartoonist. I really wanted to, to um, I just... I just felt like this is what I, I was meant to do. And so I took this comic strip to a newspaper syndicate in Kansas City, and I was up in Lincoln, and I took it down there my senior year and showed it to um, the people at this uh, major newspaper syndicate. And they said, well, this is a good strip. You know, it, it works well for a college setting, but if, if you're looking to syndicate a comic strip, you need to, um, you need to broaden broaden your experiences, um, to write about things that are more than just what's on a college campus setting. And, uh, and I knew that I was naive and I was just, uh, I, I really uh, didn't know much beyond what was going on in college. And so this kind of defined my perspective. You see, people in college um, said that what I was writing about was the truth. And yet I knew that I didn't know the truth, honestly. I didn't know, I just knew what I re experienced and I would reflect those experiences in cartoons. And actually that is the essence of what a good cartoonist is. He sees life and he filters it through his own filter system and he reflects it for the world to see. And I was doing that with this comic strip in college and people kept telling me, boy, you're just really speaking the truth. You're speaking the truth. Well. As this newspaper syndicate said, I needed to go beyond what was on the college campus. I needed to experience a lot of what life had to offer. And so I, um, um, some, of that, some of that was born out of some naivety in writing comic strips that ended up being um, somewhat racist. Um, I didn't intend to be racist. I made fun of some some uh, country bumpkin on the football team, and so I thought if I could make fun of that guy, I could make fun of uh, a black, an African American. And I came into the newspaper that next day, and and, um, and and the editor was in my face immediately, and he says, you've created more blank today in the history of this newspaper. And I looked, and behind him against the wall were all these um, African Americans waiting for me to show up and my desk was piled high with notes and I didn't realize I said gosh it must have been that comic strip I did I was just so naive I didn't understand what I was doing 
And he pulled me into his office, um, uh, and uh, or actually she, the editor in chief, pulled me into her office, and and she says, "Well, what do you want? What are you going to do? What are you going to say to him?" And I said, "Well, I guess I'm going to apologize." And so they they put the we we let in about five or six of these people, and and um, and this one gal, she's obviously just so angry, and she was very hurt, and she took the comic strip and she waved it in front of me, and she said. Mr. Wheeler, cartoons are supposed to be funny, aren't they? I want you to read panel by panel this comic strip and tell me exactly where the humor is because I don't find it funny. And I felt so low. I, I cannot remember ever feeling as poorly, as bad as I felt at this moment that I had really blown it. Um, not only was she angry, they were all hurt. And I, you know, me and my naivety of trying to explore what life had to offer I stumbled into, into making fun of a whole group of people I shouldn't have made fun of. And it made me wonder, what is it that I'm trying to do with these cartoons? I felt like if I could make fun of everyone indiscriminately, that that would be fair game. And yet, um, after she stormed out, one of the other people that was there, he just suggested that write about what you know. You don't know our world at all. And, and I said, but how is it that I can make fun of a country bumpkin one day, but I can't make fun of you people another day? And he says, because country bumpkins are, have not gone through slavery. They have not been an oppressed minority group. And I said, well, that makes sense. Um, and so it's like kicking somebody when they're down sometimes, you know. And, and I don't want to get this talk off onto, onto, onto racial things. My point behind telling you this story and this is one of many stories that happened to me when I was in college. As I'm trying to explore what truth is, I realized that there was a lot about life I didn't understand. And I was very naive. Um, I, and I knew that for me to understand what truth was so I could reflect it in the comic strip, I needed to go out and explore everything life had to offer. So that's why I put this slide up here that truth equals experience. And so I took that with me when I graduated. I've got a business degree. The dean of the business college was a fan of my cartoons, and he actually took it upon himself to help me to find a job in the business world. And um, I even had more hair in my head. But I had a little hot little sports car, and uh, I had this great job in the business world because of the connections I had, not because of my ability. And there I am, donning my hat right there. That's animation at its finest, you know? So I moved to uh, a big city and uh, began exploring what life had to offer in the corporate world. But this described my relationship with God. Um, as I mentioned, I hadn't gone to church since I was baptized at about age 11. And every time, you know, this exploring of life, every time I, I thought about trying to find out who God was, um, it was just so incredibly boring. <laughs> Somebody would invite, invite me to church, and, and I would go, and, and, uh, and I would sit there looking at my watch, wondering, when is this thing going to be over? I couldn't relate to the hymns that they were singing. I couldn't relate to the choir robes. I couldn't relate to the pastor with his big, booming voice. The, the pews were hard and uncomfortable, and I was ready to move on. And I, and I put up with this for a few times, but I never really had any kind of interest or passion of really wanting to know who God was through a church. Um, I felt like I could maybe understand him in other ways, and so I began trying to read the Bible every once in a while, and I had, a, had an older uh, version of the Bible that uh, didn't have very readable English in it, and, and I would get stuck in some of these, some of these books that uh, I just didn't understand the context, and it just didn't make sense to me. I, it re honestly, it really didn't dawn on me that what the Bible had to say and what it had to offer had anything to do with my life personally. It just, it just didn't even sink in. I thought it was always something that you had to do to be, quote, religious. I didn't know it would affect, uh, had any effect for me personally. So this was my relationship with God. Um, now, this job I had in the big city, uh, it was in a big corporation, and uh, I lasted there for about uh, eight months. I realized that I was a political football bouncing around from one department to the next according to the connections I had that got me in there. 
and people didn't accept me for who I was, they reacted to me according to um, what they thought of my connection. And so it took a while for me to realize that. And once again, my naivety um, was so great that, that I was pretty thick-headed about that. I actually thought I was there because I deserved it. And honestly, I didn't deserve it. I, I, just like the measure of success I had with my cartoons in college, I thought that would carry over into the business world and I could do anything. Well, it turns out I could do nothing. Um, and I worked at this first company for eight months and then the second corporation hired me because they thought the first corporation hired me because I had talent. And I worked there for about a year and then I got fired. I got fired. And I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I went from this peak of being this great, um, great man, big man on campus to being somebody that couldn't hold a decent job. And, um, and I knew that some of the reason that I was fired is that I couldn't throw myself fully into it because I still had my mind. I wanted to be a cartoonist. I didn't want to be in the corporate world. I wanted to be a cartoonist. That was my dream. And I couldn't throw myself fully into it, so I, I washed out. So my relationship with God from this changed to this. Um, I began trying to drag God on a leash. Now, whenever I give this talk, I ask people, uh, can you drag God on a leash? And always the answer, you know, especially talking to kids, the answer is, no, you can't drag God on a leash. But you know what? If you stop and think about it, we do try to drag God on a leash. We tell God what it is that we want. We, we say, we, we treat God so much like a genie in a bottle. You know, if we rub the lamp hard enough, then he will appear and he will give us what it is that we want. And um, as I've grown as a Christian now, I realize that, um, that we need to ask him what he wants. And uh, we can express our desires, but we can't expect him to do what it is that we want. And what I was telling God at this time was, okay, God, make me a cartoonist. And I was dragging him on this cosmic leash and I was saying, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to go back to Kansas City. We're going to camp on the doorstep of that newspaper syndicate. And we're going to work with that comic strip industry and we're going to create a comic strip that's going to be so good that they can't help but buy it. And you know what? It all started pretty good that way. I came to Kansas City. I found the cheapest apartment I could find. It was so cheap that if somebody downstairs turned on the water, I didn't get any water upstairs. And it was in a dumpy old farmhouse that had been divided up into apartments. And so um, I was working on this comic strip, and you know what? This newspaper syndicate actually kind of liked what I was working on, but it wasn't, it wasn't ready for sale. And so they would give me some instruction on how to prove the concept and how to do this, how to do that. And so I would take it home. My, um, take their ideas to home and, and I would draw some new comic strips. I'd write some more and I'd take them back to them and they'd give me some more advice. And, and this went on for um, about eight months. So during this time, I'm living off of my savings, my unemployment insurance, and living as cheaply as I possibly can. And I was single at the time. And then um, um, also during this time, I began to go to church for the first time in my life. And you know what? I ended up at a church, and I'm still at this church, that um, I was sitting on the edge of my seat because I was hearing things that were so contrary to the way I was used to living. Um, it, it, you know, I, I had dabbled into some sinful areas that, that, that um, you know, I eventually pulled out of, but even in the good areas, even in the mindset that that, that you hear in our culture, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. That actually is a lie. You can't. I remember as a kid, I would stand in my driveway and I would shoot baskets for hours on end. And I, it was just a relaxing thing to do. I would continue to shoot baskets. Um, and I, I would fantasize about being in the NBA someday. Well, you know what? I couldn't even make the high school basketball team. I didn't even try out because I knew I couldn't make the high school basketball team. Um, you cannot do anything you want if you put your mind to it. You, perseverance alone isn't going to get you there. And uh, talent is a big part of it. 
But it's also what you're called to do. What you're meant to be has something to do with it as well. Um, those three ingredients, it's the perseverance, the calling, and the, and the talent are necessary. So I was hearing a message in church that was contrary to this, you can do it, you can do it all, you know, type of message. I was hearing things such as, whoever wants to save his life must lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I was also hearing things like, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. And I was hearing things like, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So clearly there's this up and down relationship with God. What's up with God is down with man. What's down with man is up with God. This inverse relationship. And I was trying to process this all. I'm sitting in church and I'm coming back week after week. I was coming during the week. Every night of the week I would show up at this church looking for something to be part of. I remember as a 23-year-old sitting in a, a, a study on how to plan for retirement. And it's like, it had nothing to do with me, but I still remember sitting into, into groups like that just because I was so hungry and I was finding that there were things that were relevant to my life there. And things in the scriptures, I was absorbing the scripture, I was coming to worship, I was learning how to praise God and all this. And, and, and it was, uh, things were starting to come alive inside of me. But I hadn't really made this transition from thinking that I was a Christian and knowing what it says up here to really believing it down here. And then one day, I remember coming home, and um, outside my door was a big package. And I opened up the package, and inside were all the comic strips I had been drawing for this newspaper syndicate. Now let me back up a second. Newspaper syndicate, what, what is a newspaper syndicate? A newspaper syndicate is an organization that, that sells comic strips to newspapers. You can't sell a comic strip directly to a newspaper and make any money on it. You have to go through a newspaper syndicate who will sell to hundreds if not thousands of newspapers. And all the, uh, you know, of all the papers around in the U.S., you know, a couple thousand newspapers, they all run the same cartoons. There's about two dozen, four dozen people that do the same cartoons in all the newspapers. So it's a very closed industry and very difficult to get into. So, um, so I came home and there was this package with all my comic strips and there was a rejection letter in it. And apparently, um, a couple things that held me up, one of them was that um, what I was writing about was my experiences in the business world and, um, and how, um, how in over my head I was. Well, they said that their study showed that um, that kind of a concept didn't bode well with their constituents in New York. So that's part of it. Another part of it was there was a, a comic strip that they'd been working on with another guy that um, was dealing with similar themes that mine was. And they bought his strip and they didn't buy mine. So I came really close to syndicating, but then the door was slammed shut. I said, well, maybe I can write on a different theme. And they said, no, that won't work. As, as I've realized what you write about is what who you are your world you write about that and um, and you can change it to cute kittens or whatever it's still going to be the same type of a comic strip it's gonna it's gonna reflect who you are and who I was was not what they wanted so I was devastated and this picture depicts but depicts my world pretty Pretty closely at that time. I'd given up trying to drag God on a leash. I, I was totally confused. I didn't know that, um, you know, uh, that you can't make God do something, I guess. And I didn't know where to go. My experience from being manipulated in the business world according to what people thought of my connection and not according to me. Um, that prevented me from going back into that kind of a business. And I, I have a business degree, so I didn't know what I was going to do. The only thing I knew I could do was draw cartoons. So I began looking around for a job, um, maybe in an ad agency, or I looked for some art studios. And I looked around the Kansas City area, and, and you know, if they, 
They rarely needed anybody that could draw cartoons, and I didn't have the graphic arts experience, really, to be able to fit into a, a job like that. And they, um, they said, you know, if we needed cartoons, usually there's somebody on staff here that can whip up something. So they didn't need me. Man, I went all over the place. And so I was getting desperate. My money was running out. And I needed some kind of work. It was a tough economy during this time, and, and um, nobody was hiring. So I started looking for uh, a job doing anything. I was, I was thought of waitering. Well, you can make a lot of money as a waiter, you know, with tips and so forth. Nobody would hire me there because I didn't have any experience. I'd never waited tables before. And I thought, well, how about working for uh, in a warehouse or something, you know, loading boxes or something. Well, I couldn't get any job there either. And so I was really running out of options. And finally, finally, the four words that changed my life actually came to me. It wasn't anything anybody said to me. It was a, the natural cry of my heart. Um, and actually, if I had, before I leave this picture, if I had another option to take, I would have taken it before these four words came to my mind. Um, I was looking for anything to try to fix my situation and I was running out of options. I completely ran out. So these are the words that changed my life. You ready? It was, God, I give up. It was, I just remember distinctly walking around the side of my house one night and just looking up to the heavens and saying, God, I give up. I place, at this time, I place my total trust in Jesus Christ. Not only for um, my salvation, but to make him my Lord in my life. I didn't care to be a cartoonist anymore. I didn't want anything except to be totally right with him. Um, I was really at, at my lowest point. Um, I'd given up my life in a sense. I had been crucified with Christ. I knew what that was like then. When the Bible says, when Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I just experienced that. I gave up my life. And here's the interesting part of the story. I don't mean to be preachy, honestly. I'm just telling you what happened to me. But this is, this is what makes this thing pretty dramatic. Is the very next day, I remember looking out my window from my apartment down on the street level. And there's a busy boulevard down there. And on the other side of the street, there was a small company that operated out, out of these three kind of rundown houses. And uh, they had boards over the windows. I mean, I, I never would have considered walking over there looking for work months earlier. But now, I was desperate for anything. And so I, um, I walked across the street and I walked in there and I said, um, I need some work. Do you have anything for me? I'll, I'll sweep floors, I'll empty trash, I'll do anything. And they took me into the, the boss's office. It was a husband-wife team. And they began asking me questions and, and, uh, about what I've been doing. And, and uh, I told them, uh, well, I've been trying to draw a comic strip and sell it to a newspaper syndicate. I mean, I expected to see their eyes roll when I said that. Um, but instead, what they said was, you mean you're a cartoonist? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe, I suppose. Yeah, I guess you could say I'm a cartoonist. I couldn't even admit it. I was, I was that down with regard to whatever talent and ability I had. And they said, you know what? We're an audiovisual production company. What we do is we make slideshows for different companies to use as training uh, tools. For them and uh, for example one of our clients is a local airline and we we use these shows to help them train their stewardesses in the right way to work and they said if you're interested in being a cartoonist we hire we we're we've been looking for a cartoonist for three months and they sent me home to do a test drawing of a jet skiing down a mountain so I went out and got some photo reference of of one of the jets in the company that they were working with and I took it home and I I did this drawing and I put a little animated face on the thing and the hat blowing off and the scarf blowing and drew some snow and some some motion and so forth and it was actually a difficult drawing to do 
because of all that, the technical aspect, the, the motion, the animation of it. Um, and I brought it back to them, and their eyes got wide, you know, where you can see the whites all the way around. And, and it wasn't because it was a great drawing. Um, it was because it matched the style of the guy who had left three months earlier. Now, can you imagine this company had been looking for a cartoonist for three months right across the street from where I lived, and nobody filled the bill for them. I mean, if it was known that a company is looking for a cartoonist, can you imagine how many people probably applied for that over a three-month period of time? But they're looking for somebody whose style matched the style of the guy who left. And what's also absolutely amazing is this happened the day after I placed my trust in Christ. Um, this door opened. My eyes opened to it. The reason they had boards over the windows is that they kept the rooms dark inside so they could work on these slideshows. It wasn't that they were some, um, you know, small outfit that didn't know what they were doing. They, this is a very professional company. Um, and here's another aspect of this. You know, when I, when I moved to Kansas City, I, I lived right here, and this is the only place in Kansas City that hired exclusively a cartoonist right across the street. I remember walking into a firehouse. If you ever walked into a, a fire station, you'll know that they have a wall map of the entire city so that they have every street marked on there. And I, I looked on the map for my street, and I noticed that there's one sixteenth of an inch distance between where I landed, the very first place I looked at when I moved to this city, and the only place between that and the only place that hired exclusively a cartoonist. It was amazing that this job was available for me. It's amazing that God placed me there knowing that I would eventually turn my heart to Him. And, um, and you know, these people were not necessarily, they were not Christians. There was a couple of Christians that worked there, but, but the owners of the company would go to an Indian reservation and, and talk to uh, uh, the wife's dead mother, you know, do some kind of seance there. And there are people into cultic things and, and also various abhorrent lifestyles. And so it was a very eclectic company to, to work in. And um, um, so I just find it interesting that um, God did all this. He was able to use people that weren't in alignment with Him and somehow compelled them to hire me. Um, and that he knew, God knew in his sovereignty that I would eventually come to this point of giving myself totally to him. And he would direct my eyes across the street. Um, and God in his sovereignty prevented these people from hiring somebody else until I was ready. I, I, it all blows me away. Even though this happened decades ago, it still blows me away to, to stop and think about this. Now I worked there a year and a half. And because I was this brand new Christian, I was like a bull in a china shop, and I had this big bullseye on me, and, and I became a target. And I just didn't have the maturity to be able to know how to handle that very well. And I probably came across uh, very offensive with my faith. And, uh, and eventually got fired after a year and a half. In fact, I've been fired from every job I've ever had, if you want to know the truth. This is the way God has led me. He's led me by firing me into different places. So... When I left that place, the doors to Christian publishing began flying open for me. Um, I sent some samples out to a couple of different places. I went to the uh, Christian bookstore, looked at who published materials, wrote down addresses, and sent out some samples that I'd done while working in this place. And this place, uh, my time there, I got the commercial art training I needed to be able to balance out what it is that I did for a living as a cartoonist. I, be, I began to understand the whole printing process. I understood a whole lot that I didn't understand before I started working there. And I was a much better illustrator and cartoonist when I left there too. So I was ready, when they, when they pushed me out the door, I was ready for being used as a cartoonist to uh, communicate the Lord's message. Now, um, God has opened up incredible doors for me with regard to this message. Um, I have had a chance to write and illustrate a comic strip for 20 years for a denominational take-home. 
I, I had a chance and, and have been able to create a line of 70 different gospel-oriented tracks. They present the gospel message, and we'll get, I'll get into that some of that later on. Um, they present the gospel message um, in, with using humor so that it's very readable. It isn't cramming something down people's throats. And these tracks, um, people would hand them out, and they've sold 50 million copies, actually more than that now. And this message that I'm giving you today, the Lord has opened up opportunities for me to give this message dozens of times every year. In fact, um, just a couple months ago, my wife Cindy and I just returned from a two-month trip overseas where we gave this message about 20 times um, in Hawaii, Australia, New Zealand. New Zealand alone, I gave it 10 times. Um, Malaysia and Taiwan. Um, it was a two-month trip. So this is something that the Lord has done. Uh, that's a key element of what it is that's made me a successful cartoonist. In fact, it's the only element, is that this is what God has called me to do, to create cartoons, to be a communication vehicle for spreading His truths. Now, as far as what, how that applies to you, um, you've got to find your message, you've got to find your medium, and you've got to find your calling. And... Um, uh, I, I can't tell you that you have to do this. I would like to encourage you that you have to do this, give up your life and place your trust in Christ. But that's a decision you have to make. I can't make anybody do that. Um, and as far as what it is that you're going to do, it could be that you're a cartoonist, although there's not much room for more than one uh, doing what I'm doing. Um, it could be that you need to be a musician or make uh, videos or create movies or be an accountant or, or sweep streets. I don't know. But you are most likely, everybody who's listening to this is most likely gifted to do something. God has given you some in, unique gifts that if you give yourself fully to Him, He will open up the doors to where He wants to use you. That's the message of, of what it is when I tell you my story. That He wants you and He wants to use you for His glory. So thanks for listening to this. And, look forward to showing you some more things.